What's going on guys? Welcome back to the Catholic OCD podcast. Today I want to talk to you about the Blessed Mother, about our Blessed Mother, about Mary, and how Mary seems like she could have been Italian, and how she shows her love for everybody by the way that she prepares the feast table for us just like a loving Italian mother. That's the topic today on the Catholic OCD podcast. Stay tuned. You're a child of the storm, a child of the Lord. You live your life without getting bored. You lose your mind, but you find it again. And talking about grace and talking about sin. This in the world and it's gone viral. Everybody's talking about a new revival. But when it's a question of love and survival, and bluegrass and the Bible. So before we get started on this, if you guys could go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't had a chance yet. It really helps to uh, get the channel to to spread more and to reach other people and hopefully to bring people closer to our Lord. So first thing I want to do is I want to show you guys this uh, shirt that I have. I got this shirt up the other day. I went up to Little Italy in Cleveland and they have the Feast of the Assumption. It's this great Italian little festival. Uh, great Italian food. So I found this shirt that I saw there, and it says that uh, I'm a wooden spoon survivor. So this is a true story. Some of you who are watching this who might be Italian, you might have survived the wooden spoon. I know my mom always had these wooden spoons that they would use for the sauce, uh, and on multiple occasions at least probably twice in my life, I would actually have them snapped over my shoulder. This was the weapon of defense, the weapon of choice by mothers, for people who grew up in Italian households. So I can truly say that I have survived the wooden spoon. Uh, but going up to this feast, going up to Little Italy, it made me really realize, as I watched all these Italians uh, honoring our Blessed Mother, it made me really realize how Mary really does seem like she would have been this great Italian mother in the way that she prepares this feast for us. Uh, looking at Mary, looking at all these Italians up there, it also made me realize how Italians honor Jesus, worship Jesus, by somewhat showing respect and honor to his mother. When I first converted to Catholicism, or right as I was just beginning to go to the Catholic Church, my father is full-blooded Italian. He was a ex-Catholic. He grew up Catholic, and then when he met my mom, they, uh, right after I was still wet uh, in my baptism, I was about probably three months old, my parents left the Catholic Church. And we grew up, I grew up Protestant. I never even knew I was baptized Catholic till I was about 18 years old. But at the age of 24, I started going to the Catholic Church, I started getting intrigued myself. And, you know, one of the questions that I had was, you know, why do Catholics really honor Mary in this uh, unique way that I, as a Protestant growing up, really didn't? Now, as a Protestant, I always thought that Mary was a great person. I always knew that there was something special about her, that God obviously chose her, to have, uh, to have his son, but I kind of thought, well, after Mary did her role, did her duty, did uh, the job that God chose her for, I kind of figured, well, that's the end of the story with Mary. 
So it was interesting for me to see the way that so many of the Catholics from my little town called Louisville, uh, which is a very highly populated Italian town, it, it, it was interesting to see how much honor they gave to the Blessed Mother. And I remember asking my dad, who at the time was not Catholic, like, why do they, you know, why such honor to the Blessed Mother? And my dad just said, listen, I'm not going to give you this deep theology behind it, but all I could tell you is this. The way it works with Italian people is, if you really want to do something special for somebody, you do something for their mother. If you're in construction and you know a guy and you respect that guy, if you help out him, he's going to really appreciate it. But if you help out his mother, he's really, really going to appreciate it. And he kind of let me know that for the Italian people, and I understood this, but there is this aspect of like, one of the best ways you can show honor to somebody is by showing respect and honor to their mother. People looked at me differently and they knew I was with somebody. I didn't have to wait in line at the bakery on Sunday mornings anymore for fresh bread. The owner knew who I was with and he'd come from around the counter. No matter how many people were waiting, I was taken care of first. Our neighbors didn't park in our driveway anymore, even though we didn't have a car. I mean, at 13, I was making more money than most of the grown-ups in the neighborhood. I mean, I had more money than I could spend. I had it all. One day, one day some of the kids from the neighborhood carried my mother's groceries all the way home. You know why? It was out of respect. So one of the things I want to talk about then is how we also understand, though, not only do people honor somebody's mother to show respect for them, but we also understand, as Italians, I understood that mothers, Italian mothers, they love to show their love by preparing this feast for their loved ones. Now, as you can see here, I have... An Italian wife my wife is full-blooded Italian we have four kids and my wife I know shows her love for us by always preparing uh, great meals and especially uh, by taking pride in the ethnic meals that she my wife makes some of the best homemade spinach rolls pepperoni rolls she makes great sauce she makes great you know uh, spaghetti uh, and this is a great way of her showing her love for us and my wife shows her love for us by cooking for us. Now, sometimes if I get involved and I try to help out in the kitchen, then sometimes her uh, loving passion of cooking for us can switch from that to more something like this. <laughs> Amanda, what are you doing? So, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, Nick, what is all of this Italian uh, terminology and eating food and women preparing feasts? Like, in all reality, what does this have to do with the Jewish woman from 2,000 years ago? What does this have to do with Mary? Well, bear with me. What I want to do here is I want to compare and contrast two uh, feasts, two meals, two uh, foods that are presented by two different women. So let's understand the first time that we see food being offered to uh, a male, the first time we see a female offering to one of her loved ones food is going to be with Eve. We know that Eve was duped by the serpent. Eve reached out and grabbed the fruit from the tree of knowledge. Adam did not reach out from the tree and take that fruit. Adam received that fruit from 
Eve. Eve took the fruit from the tree of knowledge. And then she gives this. She offers this. She presents this to her husband. And when she presents this food, really, that will bring death and corruption into Adam, it is because Eve is presenting this food. And Adam reaches and receives and partakes of the food, the feast, the meal that was prepared or presented to him by Eve, by the mother of the living. And I want us to see how the first really food that we see that a woman presents to her loved ones, to humanity, is actually something that brings about death. We understand, and there's a whole other video that I have uh, going over how Mary is the new Eve, so you could check out that video I did before. But we do understand that in the New Testament, there has to be another meal. There has to be an antidote food. And remember, there was the tree of knowledge, but there also was the tree of life. That is what God wanted us to partake of, was from the tree of life to unite us deeply with him. How are we going to get the fruit from the tree of life? How are we going to have it? Who is going to offer it to us? Who is going to present it to us? And this is why I want us to recognize this rule that Mary has in presenting this great feast to us. Now, I'm trying to make the claim that Jesus is the fruit from the tree of life. And just as Eve was not the fruit from the tree of knowledge, Mary is not the fruit from the tree of life. But what Eve did is Eve just presented to her loved one. Eve presented to humanity the fruit from the tree of knowledge. And in the same way, I'm going to try to prove to you that Mary presents to humanity the fruit from the tree of life. We know that when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house. And what is it that Elizabeth says to Mary when Mary approaches and she says to her, blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Elizabeth is looking into the womb of Mary and recognizing that Jesus is the fruit. He is the fruit of the womb of Mary. He is the fruit from the tree of life. We understand that Jesus himself tells us this. He tells us that he is the bread of life. He is the bread of life that came down from heaven. Jesus explains this to us directly in John chapter 6. And this is why he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him and I will raise them up on the last day. We understand that Jesus himself proclaims to be the antidote food from the tree of life. He proclaims to be the bread that comes down from heaven. He is the manna that comes down from heaven. He is the antidote food. But think about how that bread of life comes down from heaven and it's really placed almost in an oven, almost in an oven in the sense that the bread of life is actually placed in the womb of Mary. The fruit from the tree of life is placed in the, in the womb of Mary. Just like you put bread in an oven. Think about this. When Mary goes to have Jesus, her and Joseph are going to go to Bethlehem. And we know that Bethlehem means the house of bread. So here we have the bread of life, the hidden manna, that has come and is placed inside the oven, you could say, inside the womb of Mary. And all of a sudden, now Mary is going to go with Joseph to the place that is called the house of bread. Now, as Mary has Jesus, when Jesus 
comes forth from Mary. Basically, when this bread of life comes out of the oven, you hear the expression, oh, you know, she's got a bun in the oven. In reality, we could say that Mary had this bread in the oven. But when Jesus, who is the bread of life, comes out of Mary, what Mary does is she's going to do with this bread of life what any Italian mother would do with any homemade meal, homemade bread, homemade pasta that now is prepared. What do Italian mothers do is they set this on the table. They're going to set it on the table and Italian mothers have this word, the old school ones used to say, hey, mange, 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 mangiamo, let's eat. Okay, so to mange comes from the Italian word mangiare. And mangiare means to eat. When you tell somebody mangia, mangia, you're telling them eat. When you say mangiamo, you're saying let's eat. So what happens with Mary is Mary takes Jesus, takes the bread of life, when he comes out of her, and where does she place him at? She places him in a manger. To many people, like when I grew up, I always heard of like, okay, I had a manger scene. For Christmas, I had a, man a manger scene. And I'll be honest with you, in my mind, if somebody said, draw a picture of a manger, I would have drawn that little, you know, the shed. I would have drawn that little shed. But that's, you know, and I would have drawn, the, you know, the cow here and the lamb here and the shepherd here. I would have drawn the whole shed. Like, the, that's the manger scene to me. But the shed's not the manger. The inn is not the manger. The manger is actually just that little eating trough. And the word manger comes from the Latin word, which is where we get, we know Italian comes from Latin. It's where we get the word mangiare from. So the word manger and the word mange. So when the Italian grandmother says, hey, mange, mange, that's the same word for the word manger. And manger in Latin can mean to eat, to, to chew. And what, why it was called a manger is this was actually the feeding trough for the animals. The animals that were in that stall, they would have their food placed in that manger. And then they would have known, okay, now we come and we eat this. What Mary was doing when she was placing Jesus, who she wrapped in swaddling clothes. And the swaddling clothes are very symbolic. They represent not only a preparation for death, but she wraps Jesus in the swaddling clothes. Some people even say that the shepherds, who, remember, these shepherds weren't just regular shepherds. These were shepherds. Their job was to raise the lambs that would be presented for the Passover feast. But when they would find a perfect, unblemished lamb, what a lot of people say is that that unblemished male lamb would be wrapped in swaddling clothes so that it would remain unblemished, so that it could be offered as a sacrifice for Passover. Mary is taking the bread of life and wrapping Jesus in these swaddling clothes and then placing Jesus in in the manger, in the eating trough. Picture Mary placing Jesus on the table as a meal and basically saying to the world, eat. And this is done. The bread of life is placed in the eating trough at Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. Now, I want us to recognize something here. If we are to look at the letter of Hebrews, I want us to compare the letter of Hebrews to what we see also in Luke with the angels and when they prepare, when they appear and when they explain to the shepherds about how Jesus is born. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, No, you have approached Mount Zion in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, in countless angels in festal gathering, in the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and God the judge of all, in the spirits of the just made perfect, 
and Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel. A couple things I want us to notice here. Number one, notice how it says that when we go to Mass, this is what Hebrews is talking about. We go to Mass, we are approaching the heavenly Jerusalem. We are approaching Mount Zion. We are approaching the same imagery that John sees in the book of Revelation. When he sees the altar and he sees the lamb that looks as if it's slain, he sees the wedding feast in the book of Revelation when he goes to heaven. Hebrews here, I believe this is Paul, who also had that same vision. Paul, who was caught up to the third realm of heaven. Paul was explaining that, yeah, when we go to the Eucharist, we approach Mount Zion. We approach the heavenly Jerusalem. And we're approaching these angels along with the saints. These are the holy ones who were made perfect. These are the ones who have been perfected. We go to this feast with them and the angels, the countless angels that are gathering in a festal gathering. That word festal gathering has the root word feast. So Paul here is explaining in Hebrews how we are surrounded by the angels who are surrounding a feast. There's The saints and the angels are surrounding this feast. And how through Jesus, who is the one mediator, there is being offered this feast and this blood that is better than the blood of Abel. Remember, Eve who offered Adam this fruit that brought to death. Eve had a son. And Abel is the first child who is killed that we read about in the Bible. Abel is the first child of Eve to be killed. And Jesus is the child of Mary to be killed. And Hebrews here is saying how the blood of Jesus, the, the, the son of Mary's blood is more valuable than the blood of Eve's son, Abel. But when we compare this, the angels here that Hebrews is talking about surrounding this feast, when we see these countless angels surrounding the feast, now let's compare that to, let's compare that to Luke. So when Jesus is placed, we see in this eating trough, when we compare Luke to Hebrews, we're going to see Luke chapter 2 says this. Now there were shepherds in that region living in the fields and keeping the night watch over their flock. The angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were struck with great fear. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I proclaim to you good news of the great joy that will be for all people. For today, in the city of David, a Savior has been born for you, who is Messiah and Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those who of whom his favor rests. We understand that as Mary places Jesus in the eating trough, again, just like in Hebrews, we're going to see all this multitude of angels, and they're telling the shepherds, now there is peace. There is peace because Mary has placed the bread of heaven in the eating trough. That will be the sign. You will see a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, placed in a manger. These shepherds would have understood the significance of the swaddling clothes. And they also would have understood the purpose of a manger, the purpose of the eating trough. Again, this is Mary here placing Jesus, just like this Italian mother, she's placing Jesus in the eating trough, and she's telling the whole world, come and eat. Manja, you know, uh, come to the table and eat. Come to the table and munge. Wonderful. A lot of complexity in the wine. A lot of complexity in this lasagna. So, let's have a feast. Una festa. 
And as we say at my house, tutti a tavola a mangiare. So listen, with this video, some of you who are watching this, maybe you're not Italian at all. Maybe it's annoying to you. Maybe some of you find it humorous. Obviously, was Mary Italian? Of course not. We all know she was a Jewish woman. And let's be honest, it's not just Italian mothers who love to feed and, and present uh, food out of love to everybody. We understand that this is what all great mothers do. But I just want us to see how Mary really could have been one of the greatest Italian Mother, she probably would have been the greatest Italian mother ever. And I just want us to understand the significance of Mary placing Jesus in the manger. This is not just her saying, I don't want to hold him anymore. If you could get it in your mind with the whole world watching and everybody sitting or around the table, all these Italian guys like me with a big belly, sitting around a table waiting for the meal. And if you've ever had that imagery of your mother or your grandmother, approaching the table with this big pot of you know pasta or this big you know whatever you guys eat and placing it on the table and then saying to everybody with love in her heart munch munch okay eat that's what i want us to see this truly is what mary is doing this actually is the purpose and the intent of the bible showing us this and I just want us all to recognize. Now, if you're somebody watching this and you're a type of Christian where you're like, not only do I not uh, respect or honor Mary because I think she just was used by God and just now she's dead. And uh, so I don't honor her. I don't respect her. I don't ask her to pray for me. And you're thinking to yourself, well, plus I don't even believe in the Eucharist. I just, I don't even believe that the, the, uh, that the Eucharist actually is the the fruit from the tree of life i actually don't even think that jesus literally means you know to eat them well you're probably not going to like this video but for everybody else i hope that this makes sense to you guys and i just want to show that yeah for me just going up to the feast in little italy seeing all these italians loving food honoring the blessed mother it just encouraged me to make this video because mary even though she's not italian she would have made a heck of an Italian. We'll see her again talking about food, right? At the wedding at Cana. And again, that seems pretty Italian to me. Hey, Chloe, let me have some wine. Chloe, go on. Josie, please. Ah, you look terrific on the floor. All right, guys. I hope you like this video. If you like it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Share it with your friends. Leave your comments. Uh, in the bottom, if you're Italian watching this, you know what? Tell me the best thing that your mom ever made. Because to me, going up to the Feast of the Assumption, I grew up Protestant. If you would ask me what the Feast of the Assumption was, you know, I'll be honest with you. My mom never made brajol. We didn't usually have brajol. And people would come over and they would be like, hey, where's the brajol? But we don't make it. I assumed that she, well, why would you think we made brajol? I assumed she made it. I would assume she made brajol. And then that's what I thought was the Feast of the Assumption. You just went to that feast. You assumed my mother made brajol. She didn't make brajol. It was the Feast of the Assumption. Now, as a Catholic, I can appreciate the true meaning of the Feast of the Assumption a little bit better. All right, guys. See you guys next time. Peace out. Ciao. Yeah, baby.